Welcome to the Cosmic Savannah with Dr. Jacinta Delhaze and Dr. Daniel Kahneman. Each episode, we will be giving you a behind the scenes look at world class astronomy and astrophysics happening under African skies. Let us introduce you to the people involved, the technology we use, the exciting work we do, and the fascinating discoveries we make. Sit back and relax as we take you on a safari through the skies. Welcome to episode 43. Yes, episode 43. And today we will be talking all about neutral hydrogen gas, which is one of my two very favorite topics. We will be speaking to Tarek Bletcher, who was a PhD student at the University of Rhodes, and also to Shilpa Ranchot, who has just finished her master's at the University of Pretoria and is now doing her PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy uh, at the University of Bonn in Germany. What is your other favourite topic? Active galactic nuclei. Oh, right, okay. Hmm. Giant radio galaxies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so yourself, um, but, but, but not yourself specifically, your work. <laughs> yes, my own research. Obviously, how, how could that not oh, be my good. most what a, favourite topic? What, what, a, what a blessing to be able to work in something you love. Do you want to tell us how the awards night went, Dan? It was disappointing because because I, because I didn't win and neither did we. No, but it was it was really cool. Got dressed up in my tux and I mean to be honest, it it was a really special evening. I think that they did a very good job of making the finalists feel really honoured and and I think it it was an incredible achievement to be selected as a finalist, and that feeling really sat with me. And uh, yeah, I walked away happy and smiling. I had a great evening. Well, you. Walked away on cr- with crutches, I suppose. <laughs> I, ho- I hopped away, yes. So I was. You I hopped had, away. I had my nice fancy tux and a moon boot. <laughs> yeah, yes. So for those who haven't heard our previous episode and don't know what we're talking about, the Cosmic Savannah was a finalist for the Communication Award in the NSTF South 32 Science Awards for South Africa, so kind of like the Science Oscars. And Dan managed to go to the gala dinner, the awards night in person, uh, looked very dapper in a custom-made tux. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, while I watched in my pyjamas from Australia late at night over Zoom or YouTube. And yeah, it looked like an amazing night. Exciting that these sorts of events can start to happen very slowly and socially distanced now with the vaccination levels getting higher. And also congratulations to Associate Professor Carolina Odman, who took out the award for her amazing work that she does also with translating into different languages, astronomy and related fields. Yeah, absolutely. A, a worthy winner and yeah, happy to be included amongst such great company. So back to the episode topic of today, which is neutral hydrogen gas. Yeah, so uh, Jacinta, you spoke to Tariq and Shilpa. Maybe because it's one of your two favorite topics, you can explain very briefly to new listeners uh, what neutral hydrogen is. Sure. Well, I I worked in this area for my PhD and I ended up talking to Shilpa a little bit about that. You'll hear that later. But neutral hydrogen gas is just, I mean, it's hydrogen, which is the kind of first element on the periodic table. It's the most abundant element in the universe, but it's also really quite hard to detect. So galaxies usually have this hydrogen gas inside them and sort of around them. And this is the, the raw fuel for star formation. So it's like a really fundamental mental building block of a galaxy but it's actually really hard to detect it's very diffuse meaning it's spread out over a large area and it's like very faint it only glows or releases light at a very particular frequency which is in the radio which you can detect with a radio telescope and it's a quite a weak signal so the challenge is to be able to, to detect the hydrogen gas out to large distances across the universe in order to kind of study how this property of galaxies has changed over time and so this is a really important way that we try and study galaxy evolution. And so I was talking to Tariq and Shilpa about their work in this area, about how hydrogen gas exists within groups of galaxies or within clusters of galaxies, and this particular topic that we talk about today, which is gravitational lensing. Do you want to have a go at what gravitational lensing is? Why don't you tell our listeners, Dan? (laughs) It's not that you don't understand, it's just that you're giving me a chance to talk. I did all the interviews, so let's hear. Uh, Our listeners want to hear from you. Oh, right, okay. (laughs) No, gravitational lensing is something that's super cool. I just love the, the picture of it and the idea of it. So when you think of a lens, 
you normally think of a, a glass lens. It's a piece of curved glass. If you had them in high school and you sort of passed light through, you could see how the rays bent as they passed through a lens. The same is for your eyes if you, have, if you wear glasses. And in this way, light can be bent and focused and magnified. And what we're talking about today is something called gravitational lenses. So we also know that space and time can bend under the influence of a lot of mass. And what that means is that the light ray appears to bend as it curves around a large galaxy or cluster of galaxies. And that creates something like a lens. So if you're looking at a large cluster of galaxies, which is a huge amount of mass and is bending and curving space and time, light from behind that cluster can curve around the cluster on its way to us and be curved and magnified. And in that way, you can actually look behind these massive clusters and you can get a lot of magnification from that, which means you can actually look at something behind the lens in quite a lot more detail in some cases than you could you could if you're just looking at the cluster, for example. Yeah, exactly. And there's been different kinds of light that's been detected by gravitational lensing of galaxies that you wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. They would have been too faint. But hydrogen gas, the signal of hydrogen gas, has never been detected in this sort of gravitational lens system. And so Tariq was trying to make the first gravitational lens detection of H1, which is the short name for hydrogen gas. Shall we just hear from Tariq and let him explain how he tried to do that? Great, thank you. Guest, who who are you? My name is Tarek Bletcher. I am a PhD student, but I don't let that define me. <laughs> <laughs> Wise. Where are you from? Born and bred in Cape Town. Uh, what university are you at? A sort of a complicated arrangement. I'm registered at University currently known as Rhodes, which is in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. But I'm based at the Astronomy Institute in Cape Town. Um, but I sort of drift all over the place a lot. I've got supervisors, one supervisor in Pretoria, another in Oxford, another in Australia. And added to that, I'm always, I'm often like just on my own adventures. Okay, and can you tell us a little bit about what you do as a PhD student? So the general field is trying to work out how, why galaxies are the way that, that we see them today, how they've come to be from like an early universe that is smooth to now a sort of later universe that we find ourselves in, which is like filled with all these interesting shapes and forms. So the general field is sort of how do galaxies evolve. I'm like tackling a little slice of the pie, looking specifically at gas in galaxies. So as part of your talk, you mentioned gravitational lensing. Perhaps you mm. could talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Well, Einstein's theory of general relativity, one of the consequences of it is that mass interacts with light and basically heavy things will change the path that light naturally takes. And what can happen if say I want to look at a distant galaxy but in between me and this distant galaxy there's another extremely massive object say another galaxy or a cluster of galaxies and now shift your focus to the galaxy that we want to see this very very distant one you can imagine the light as rays emanating from from this background galaxy and normally the light rays would sort of you can think of it as these lines going off in a sphere sort of equally in all directions but when the light rays sort of come near this massive galaxy cluster, they bend around it because of this general relativity effect. And what can end up happening is that it sort of becomes almost like a, a magnifying glass in a way, or a lens, where the image of the background galaxy is now magnified. So basically trying to use this natural magnification to see more faint and distant objects. And you spoke today about looking at hydrogen gas inside lensed galaxies. Has hydrogen been seen in lensed galaxies before? Uh, no, it hasn't been seen. Like many other things have been seen with this lensing. Typically sort of very compact objects, um, such as the emission from black holes or 
a carbon monoxide emission, which is generally quite localized. Neutral hydrogen hasn't been detected yet. There are some good reasons for this. Basically because neutral hydrogen is the most extended galactic component, gaseous component, and this sort of dampens the effect of the lensing a bit, especially for lensing in sort of the nearby objects. Also, the hydrogen is really, really, really faint. So even if it's lensed, if it's incredibly far away, it still won't be bright enough to see. At the moment, like I'm still sort of investigating the sort of feasibility of, of using lensing for, for neutral hydrogen. I'm still sort of trying to find the best sort of lenses. At the moment, I've, I've just used lenses that are the size of galaxies. Now I'm sort of experimenting with lenses that, that come in groups of galaxies or, or hundreds of galaxies because these have like more potential for giving higher magnifications. But the problem with these is, is that they're rarer and so they're further away. And so the thing that they're lensing is even further away. So everything becomes very faint, yeah. So why do you actually want to detect neutral hydrogen in lensed galaxies? What's important about neutral hydrogen? So neutral hydrogen, you can think of it this way. In your periodic table, hydrogen is like the, it's the simplest element. It's quite a fundamental element. Most of the, what they call baryonic matter, which is basically all sort of matter that we're familiar with in our everyday lives, most baryonic matter in the universe is hydrogen. Uh, so it's quite an important element. There's just like a ton of science that you can do with neutral hydrogen. It's been explored, but it hasn't been explored to very far distances because it's so faint. But for instance, uh, just one one particular aspect of neutral hydrogen research that that I'm quite interested in is if you measure the amount of neutral hydrogen in a galaxy and you measure the amount of molecular hydrogen in, in a galaxy. So basically there's a process that physical process that converts the neutral hydrogen into molecular hydrogen. It's based on like the, the pressure that the neutral hydrogen is exposed to. And this, this pressure is dependent on the galaxy as a whole. And it's quite strongly dependent on what's called the dark matter halo, which the galaxy resides in. And this is quite like a mysterious sort of a substance that we're not really sure exactly what it's made of. But with the sort of molecular hydrogen to neutral hydrogen ratio, you can track um, the amount of uh, dark matter in galaxies. And if you track this ratio at different points in the universe, you can see how the dark matter properties are changing. Just one example of something you can do with H1. So you've actually been using a telescope in India to try and find this lensed hydrogen, haven't you? Yeah, I've been using it's the giant meter wave radio telescope. Uh, GMRT. Yeah, the GMRT is about, what is it, 30 dishes made of a sort of mesh material. It's located near Pune. Yeah, I've actually had a lot of experience sort of applying to the GMRT. What's really nice about astronomy is that there are loads of observatories that you can just apply for, and it's completely free to apply. You can get as much data as you need as long as the merit of your application is really good. And the GMRT is one of these telescopes where literally anyone can just put in an application. It's completely free. It's like really heartwarming that that it is such a meritocracy that you're not having to pay like a billion rand or whatever to get time. So, yeah, so we put an application in the GMRT. It's quite a sensitive telescope, so, yeah. Well, congratulations on getting time with GMRT. I'm sure a group of international experts reviewed your application and decided to award it time. How much time did you receive, and what did you do with the data? That proposal was made by my supervisor before I started the PhD. But I have since put in a couple of proposals, and one of them has gotten time. So with the data... Although it is free to apply, the data is presented to the user in quite a raw format. So there is quite a lot of work that goes in from the raw data to science quality. Yeah, and I sort of had to learn to the different um, sort of software packages that one needs. How much time did you receive on the GMRT? Uh, uh, this was about eight nights of observations. Or oh, actually, I think there were also days included because with the radio you can also observe during the day. 
Mm, so eight, about eight days. Mm. So now I, I guess you've processed all of the data, you've learned how to reduce it, and you've been doing some science with it at the end. So what have you found? Um, well, we there were three galaxies which we observed. For two of the galaxies, there's clearly like no detection. For one galaxy, there's sort of a hint of a possible detection, but you can't really say for sure because the signal is not strong enough. In hindsight, the proposal was maybe a little bit too ambitious because H1 is so faint and a few nights per source is, is really not much. Um, but it, it was quite exciting that we got some hint and we'll do follow-up observations on that. Yeah, you certainly have to start somewhere and it's really exciting mm. that you might have found a hint of lensed hydrogen, which would definitely be some pretty big news. Mm. But you told us in your conference presentation that you are trying to find find out some extra information about these systems. You made some, some non-detections here, which is what we call things that we didn't detect. But can we actually still get any information about these galaxies from, from the non-detections? This was quite an interesting point that was raised by my co-supervisor, Daniel. He's quite a, quite a smart guy. So originally when I, I presented him with the non-detections, I just presented them as uh, upper limits to him. And I said, you know, we can be sure that what we're looking for is not anything brighter than, than say, this factor times the, the noise. And he was like, no, 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 no. The, what about you leaving out information? I was like, I'm leaving out information? And then, yeah, he, actually, if you look closely, even if we didn't make it a detection, there's actually a lot of other information that we can sort of leverage to get more information about the neutral hydrogen. So essentially we know from the optical Hubble and SDSS data, we know exactly where the galaxy should be. So we know exactly where to look. And we also know the statistics of the noise. Say you, you buried something in the ground, not too deep, quite shallow, and there's sort of a little mound maybe left over from what you buried. And maybe after some time, this is where the noise is coming in. So the ground has shifted a bit and, you know, slightly buried your, your signal. This is what I'm, um, the analogy that I'm trying to get of, like, this hydrogen signal that's being buried in the noise. But we know where to look. You can tell, like, if whatever was buried in the ground, if it was really huge, then you would expect there to be, even if it's buried, the probability that there would be a positive noise or that there would be a slight positive bump in the ground. The probability of that is higher if the object that you buried is higher or if H1 flux is, is bigger. Um, and the same, if there's no hydrogen in the galaxy, then there's sort of equal probability that there's sort of a slight indent in the ground or a mound over the ground. So we basically came up with a way of getting the statistics of the thing that we did not see based on knowing what the noise looks like and exactly where to find it. It's complicated to explain, but I think you did a really good job. So we can find out some information about this object, even though we can't detect it, but we do know where it is, so at least we know where to look, and that itself gives us, gives us some extra clues, right? So are you going to publish this work? Yeah, so the plan is to publish it by the end of the week, but these sort of research deadlines always seem to be pushed back. Well, good luck. You used the GMRT telescope in India for this work. Do you think South Africa's new radio telescope, Meerkat, will, will be used for this in the future? Yeah, so I've actually got some Meerkat data just waiting to be used. Just had my hands full with this paper, but planning on getting, getting to it as, as soon as possible. Now that is exciting. I can't wait to see the results from that. Yeah, especially we've got some... So the previous data, it was the lenses were galaxies, which are sort of well behaved, but are sort of smaller, smaller scale. And this cluster stuff is really like thinking big. Yeah, so it'll be really exciting to use entire clusters as, as huge magnifying glasses to, to detect very distant hydrogen. I think the lensing phenomena is going to be quite different. In the galaxies, what was nice is that it was quite well behaved. So we could characterize it well. The thing is, in clusters, the the models of the of the cluster is more uncertain. You have these huge collections of galaxies that have been merging, and you maybe have multiple of these clusters merging together. 
and so there's sort of more uncertainties involved. So we're just going to have to develop techniques that are more related to blind, sort of blind surveys where you, you don't really know exactly where to expect the detection, but you sort of search over a larger, larger area. Right, so instead of choosing one tiny patch of the sky to look at because mm. you suspect something's there, you just kind of stare at an entire big patch of sky and maybe find something. Exactly, yeah. How do you feel about the environment of astronomy in South Africa? Astronomy is booming. So it's pretty exciting to be in South Africa. It's unbelievable how many astronomers there are in the country now. Thanks. You you recorded that a while ago and a very interesting work. Do you know what Tariq's up to these days? Yeah, so Tariq, he did submit his paper and he's actually now finished his PhD. This chat with Tariq actually happened quite a while ago, well before COVID hit. That's why we were together in person at a conference. And yeah, he's now finished his PhD and is working as a data scientist. Great. And Shilpa, you interviewed very recently. I know that there was quite a lot of fuss around Shilpa's recent paper. I know I got many phone calls <laughs> about it and gladly passed them on to her. So I, I assume you spoke to Shilpa about that too. Yeah, so Shilpa was looking at hydrogen gas in clusters and trying to detect it in those systems. So clusters are, you know, groups of groups of galaxies and the more galaxies you have in in your environment the less likely you as a galaxy are to have hydrogen gas and so Shilpa's trying to understand how much hydrogen gas is in galaxies that are quite far away from us and therefore kind of existed back in the history of the universe and she also does a little bit of work on gravitational lensing so she explains to us her master's research which she did at the University of Pretoria. Great. Uh, looking forward to it. With us today, we have Shilpa Ranchod, who is a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn. Welcome to the Cosmic Savannah, Shilpa. Hi, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Can you tell our listeners just a little bit about yourself to begin with? Okay, so my name is Shilpa Ranchard. I'm originally from Cape Town in South Africa, and I also did my BSc in Physics and Astronomy and my BSc Honours with NASP at the University of Cape Town. I then went on to do my Master's at the University of Pretoria, and now I've just started my PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn in Germany. And you've just moved there. Yes, it's been about three weeks now. Three weeks. Oh, in the Northern Hemisphere. How are you finding it so far? Starting to get a, a little chilly. <laughs> Already? Um, so that's a, a bit of an Uh-oh. adjustment, yeah. <laughs> but, it's, but it's been great so far, yeah. All right, great. So you've just moved there. And before that, you were doing your master's at the University of Pretoria. What was your master's about? Um, so my master's just broadly was searching for H1 or neutral hydrogen gas in galaxy groups and clusters. All right, great. So now I know a lot about H1, neutral hydrogen gas. I did a lot of research in that for my PhD. Um, but for our listeners at home, we have done episodes on this in the past, but maybe we have some new listeners. So could you tell people a little bit about what H1 is? So H1, as I said, is neutral hydrogen. It's the most abundant gas in the universe, and it's the essential ingredient for star formation. Even though it is so abundant, it is extremely faint and difficult to observe and can only be observed with radio telescopes. All right. And you have been using one of South Africa's very powerful radio telescopes to study this. Yes, I've been using Meerkat and it's really returned some very awesome results. All right. So tell us about your data. Uh, what was it of and what did you find? So the first part of my master's was part of MITE, which stands for the Meerkat International Gigahertz Tiered Extragalactic Exploration. 
so that's a, quite a um, quite <laughs> a, a mouthful. Long name. Yeah, <laughs> but it's this is one of Meerkat large survey projects. So this was part of the H1 component of of Mighty, and Mighty just observes a very large portion of the sky. And the Mighty team worked very hard to reduce and calibrate the data so that it was ready for me to work with. And with this, we just looked through it by eye to find any blips of H1. And with that, we just discovered a galaxy group. Okay, so what is a galaxy group? So a galaxy group is a collection of of galaxies that are gravitationally bound to each other, which means that they evolve together and influence each other's evolution. Okay, and so had this group been found before? Did we know about it? What was special about it? So these galaxies in this group, they've been observed many times before with optical and infrared telescopes, but they were assumed to be individual and unrelated because they were against the background of hundreds and thousands of other galaxies. But by detecting neutral hydrogen emission from these galaxies, uh, we were more accurately able to tell the distance of those galaxies from Earth. And that led us to believe that instead of just being close together in projected space, they were actually close together in a three-dimensional space. And this led us to, to believe that they are gravitationally bound and a galaxy group. Okay, yeah, because when we look up at the night sky, you know, we're seeing stars and little dots of light, which could be galaxies or planets or anything. And we're essentially seeing it in 2D because we can't tell how far away each of these things are. And so you're saying that with these radio astronomy observations with of the hydrogen gas, you could tell how far away each of these galaxies were. And therefore, you could tell that these particular ones were all close to one another. Yes, exactly. What was even more exciting about this group is that it was extremely neutral hydrogen rich. And this led us to believe that it was in the early stages of formation. Okay, so the the galaxies each had a lot of hydrogen gas. So why does that mean we think it's in the early stage of galaxy evolution? Because dense environments like galaxy groups and clusters, they're quite violent, what galaxy clusters are anyway. And in the process of joining and evolving in a dense environment, galaxies can lose a lot of their neutral hydrogen gas. And because these galaxies still had so much, it shows that they hadn't been a part of the group environment for a very long time. Okay, so you found kind of a a young group of galaxies, right? Okay. What does this tell us about galaxy evolution? Well, this in itself doesn't tell us too much, but it is a unique snapshot of a galaxy group in its evolutionary timeline. And This, along with other observations of massive groups like this and and simulations, can put together the whole picture of how galaxy groups evolve from the beginning to the end of their evolution. Okay, so you mentioned that you used data from the MITEI survey, uh, and listeners may remember from uh, episode 31, where I was my own guest on this podcast, that I used data from the MITEI survey with Meerkat to study to study giant radio galaxies. MITEI has several different components, and you're looking at a slightly different component or a different way of looking at the sky than the data that I was using, but we're part of the same big collaboration. Why hadn't this group of galaxies been found by other telescopes before? Had other telescopes just not looked at this part of the sky or is there something special about Meerkat and Mighty that helped you find them? Yeah, I mean, the latter, Meerkat has such great sensitivity. It's able to pick up emission that has never been detected before. And as I mentioned earlier, H1 is extremely faint. So it is thanks to to Mighty's great sensitivity that we were able to, to detect this group. So you actually published a paper on this, right? Yes, in July. Congratulations on getting a a paper out during your master's. That's really a big achievement. And I saw that you actually put out a press release for this discovery. How was that experience? Oh, that was a whirlwind. Um, There was a lot happening, a lot of phone calls, interviews. It just went on and on and on. But it was extremely exciting to have the opportunity to communicate my work to the general public and also get some recognition that way. I heard you on the radio. Did you do any TV as well? I did. I did one on ETV News. So that was quite exciting. How cool. Was that sort of your first experience doing that sort of thing? 
<laughs> yes, yes, I definitely would do it again. Well, you were fantastic. I, I heard you and it was it was so good. Yeah. What, so did you find that there was a lot of interest from the public and from the media in this sort of thing? Yes, I think people were particularly excited about Meerkat and just the fact that a South African telescope has been able to produce world-class results. I think everybody is quite excited about that. Definitely. It's something that, you know, the people of South Africa and of Africa can be very, very proud of. So it's, yeah, it's really awesome to see that our students are, you know, using this and making some big discoveries already. So tell me, Shilpa, what are you, what have you been working on since then? Well, that was only one half of my master's. For the rest of it, we were looking at or searching for neutral hydrogen in galaxy clusters, which are similar to galaxy groups, but much, much bigger. And because these environments are so turbulent and violent, there's a lot less H1 gas in galaxies that reside in clusters. So that was a challenge, but with Meerkat and its really amazing sensitivity, as I mentioned before, we were hoping to detect H1 in these clusters that also much, much further than the group that we discovered was. Yeah, so these are at a rate shift of 0.3 to 0.4, which is very far away. I don't know what that is. <laughs> is in mega parsecs. Yeah, just suffice us to say that that's a lot further away than these other galaxies that yeah, you were looking very, at. Very, very right? far away. Yeah. Billions of light years away, I yes. guess. Um, yes. Yes. So, so, yeah, so we use the statistical method in order to actually detect the signals from the galaxies in the clusters. Now, I'm going to hazard a guess that you used stacking to do this. Yes, <laughs> um, it is. Um, yeah, so stacking is a statistical method that co-adds the signals from the H1 signals from many galaxies in order to reduce the noise and get a higher signal to noise ratio and then hopefully make a detection. In one of our mini episodes previously, we spoke with student Andy Firth, who was also kind of playing with H1 data cubes and trying to do stacking. He, he used a slightly different sort of technique than what you're, you're doing. But, but I think that what you're working on is similar to what I did for my PhD, right? Maybe you might know about that? Yes, no, I, I know very well about that. I think I, I've referenced your paper quite a few times in my master's thesis. Oh, well, um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so we looked at three different galaxy clusters and in two of them, we didn't find any H1 emission even after stacking. Oh, right. But in one of them, we did make a three sigma detection. So that was quite exciting. Okay, so so for our listeners, what does three sigma mean? Is that a strong detection or? Um, it, it is not the most strong detection. I think we can confidently say that there is definitely some, some H1 there. So had this not been found before in this particular cluster? No. In fact, these clusters, um, two of the three clusters had never been observed in H1 emission before. So this was really something new that we were trying out with Meerkat. Okay, and so you made sort of like a a weak but not too weak stacked detection. So that means if I could just repeat what you said before. So instead of just looking at one galaxy for a long time to try and detect the H1 signal from it, you look at many galaxies. I don't know how many you looked at. Um, well, we observed the whole cluster and because the cluster is so far away, it fits very um, well within Meerkat's primary beam. Yeah, so we were able to observe the whole entire cluster, but we were only really able to stack a few clusters, so stack a few galaxies, because we only had a few spectroscopic redshifts. Right, so you only knew the exact kind of distances to a few of these galaxies. Yes, um, exactly. Right, and that's essential information that you need in order to stack. And so, so you combine the signals of these galaxies together and you made a statistical detection. So you didn't directly detect hydrogen in any of them individually, but combining them all together you can detect a, a slight detection, right? Well, yes, an average um, an amount average. of H1 between those okay. galaxies. And, and what did you find out about the average properties of hydrogen gas in, in this cluster? So what we did look at was the H1 deficiency parameter of these clusters, including the ones uh, where we didn't detect any H1. 
but we found that it was consistent with what we predicted. So there isn't much H1 in this cluster or in any of these clusters because we don't expect to see too much H1 in clusters. So how much hydrogen gas did you find in these galaxies when you did the stacking? Okay, so we found of order 10 to the 10 solar masses of H1 gas um, between these galaxies. Okay, so that sounds like a lot. Is that a lot? It is a lot, and it's much more than, than we expected. So we do think that this, this amount was falsely boosted um, due to the fact that a lot of the galaxies that we stacked were really, really close together. And sometimes when that happens, it's called source confusion. The signal can be artificially boosted as some of emission from one galaxy is counted as part of another. Okay, so you're like double counting some of the hydrogen signal from several different galaxies together and so you're kind of adding up too much is that right yes exactly and with our limited redshift information and with the limited resolution of meerkat we weren't able to model this any further okay yes well i know i know all about the confusion of confusion <laughs> um my when i was using when i wrote my papers on stacking this was back in 2000 and what year was my paper 2013. 13. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad one of us knows. <laughs> okay. Um, back when I wrote my paper in 2013, Meerkat didn't exist. ASCAP didn't exist. These other telescopes didn't yet exist. So I was using the Parkes Radio Telescope in New South Wales. And that has a much, much, much worse resolution than Meerkat. And so almost all of my galaxies were confused together. And so I was double counting hydrogen all over the place. And one of my papers, my second paper didn't actually get to be published because uh, because there was so much confusion, we couldn't even figure out what was going on. So I don't know why I'm talking about my own research so much right now. <laughs> Apologies for that. But just to say that like this stuff is actually really hard. So just round of applause for, for doing this in your master's. It's really amazing stuff. Thank you. <laughs> and you also mentioned to me earlier that you work on something called gravitational lensing. We spoke earlier to Tariq Bletcher, who I think is one of your collaborators, uh, one of your colleagues. Uh, and, and do you work on something to do with that as well? Yes. So um, I'm sure Tariq explained it very nicely, but galaxy clusters are particularly great for observing the gravitational lensing phenomenon. And we can observe very distant galaxies that are behind these clusters because their light is magnified by the clusters because they're so massive. And through this, we were hoping to detect even more distant H1. Unfortunately, we didn't make any detections, but yeah, hopefully that will be done with future meerkat observations. Okay. Yeah, I just would like to advertise maybe quickly that there's another paper coming oh. on the H1 stacking and the gravitational lensing search that's been submitted to MINRAS. So yeah, you'll hopefully see it on the archives. All right, watch this space. <laughs> Good luck with that. And so now you have moved on to your PhD in, uh, in Germany. Are you working on something similar? No, I'm doing something completely different. Um, I'm still going to be using Meerkat, but I'm not looking at H1 neutral hydrogen at all. I'm going to be working with magnetism and polarization. Magnetism. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool. Tell us more about that. Mm, maybe in a year once I've actually gotten stuck into my work. I okay, okay, fair enough. Fair <laughs> at the, enough. <laughs> yeah, at the moment, everything is very new. I only really started about a week ago. Okay, but so you'll be working on the, the fact that galaxies have magnetic fields? Yes. So, um, so the data that I'm working with is observed as part of the Max Planck Galactic Plane Survey, which is a meerkat survey of the galactic plane and a little bit above and a little bit below. And what I'll be looking at is the extra galactic sources that are in the background of the galactic plane and characterizing the polarization um, and magnetic field properties. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, um, Shilpa, and explaining all of your exciting work. Um, do you have any final messages for listeners? Yes. I mean, for any people out there that are interested in science and interested in astronomy, I mean, this has been 
such a great experience. There's been so many opportunities to work with as part of like large international collaborations to go overseas, to, to live overseas. And yeah, I highly recommend it. With, with Meerkat, there have been such exciting results. And I think we can only look forward to what the SKA will bring. So yeah, for everyone out there that's interested in astronomy, particularly women of color, don't be shy. Um, yeah, jump in. It's a it's a great career choice. Absolutely. Uh, and where can listeners find you online if they want to follow you? I'm not too big on social media, but you can follow me on Instagram. It's Hello Shilpa, H E L L O S H I L P A. Or if you have any questions about my work, you can contact me on email, shilparanchard at gmail.com. Great. And we'll put those details on our show notes on the website. Thank you so much, Shilpa, once again for joining us um, and a huge good luck for your PhD. I'm sure you'll be fantastic and do keep in touch and let us know how you're going. Thank you very much. Yeah, so Tariq and Shilpa both talking about how amazing Meerkat is, which, you know, we sing its praises every single episode. And this is, of course, the, the radio telescope in the Karoo region in, in South Africa and just how powerful and sensitive it is. And the fact that, again, you could just turn it on and then just see this group of galaxies there that no one had ever noticed before. Yeah, it's just testament to how powerful this thing is and really exciting that Shilpa could make this kind of a discovery in her master's. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for students to have access to this Meerkat data is incredible. And then for Shilpa to get the recognition for making this discovery, getting noticed by the press and the media, very, very cool. Yeah, very exciting. And of course, now really awesome that she's moved to Germany, to Bonn, to the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy to, you know, continue on her career and to change fields a bit. I think it's really great that when students kind of change fields earlier on in their careers to get more experience in different areas. That's sort of what I did. I did my PhD on H1 and then I changed for my first postdoc into kind of these AGN, these active galactic nuclei that I've spoken about at length previously. And it just gives you like a, a more general overall understanding of, of your astronomy field, which was really awesome. So good on her for, for doing that. It's, it's brave. It is brave starting again on something new. But as you say, I mean, the, Obviously, all of the astronomy is connected and, and having this experience in, in different fields is wonderful and actually quite useful in some ways to provide insight, which other people who have, have stuck to one field might not have. Yeah. And congratulations again to Tariq and Shilpa for finishing their respective PhDs and masters. Uh, not an easy task, as we well know. And just really awesome to see African students coming up through the system and, and becoming budding astronomers. And as you said, I mean, traveling the world, uh, getting some experience overseas and, you know, who knows if they will return to South Africa, but it hardly matters. I think, you know, astronomy is such a global field and just wonderful to see these opportunities for, for young African astronomers. Absolutely. All right. And with that, I think that is it for today's episode. Thanks very much for listening and we hope you'll join us again for the next episode of The Cosmic Savannah. You can visit our website, thecosmicsavannah.com, where we'll have the transcript, links, and other stuff related to today's episode. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at Cosmic Savannah, and that's Savannah spelled S-A-V-A-N-N-A-H. Special thanks today to Terek Bletcher and Shilpa Ranchard for speaking with us. Thanks to our social media manager, Sumari Hatton. Also to Mark Olnott for music production, Jacob Fine for sound editing, Mihal Wercek for photography, Carl Jones for astrophotography, and Susie Karras for graphic design. We gratefully acknowledge support from the South African National Research Foundation, the South African Astronomical Observatory, and the University of Cape Town Astronomy Department. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd really appreciate it if you could rate and review us or recommend us to a friend. And we'll speak to you next time on the Cosmic Savannah. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, fo- and Instagram. Weirdly, <laughs> that I was going to do it. <laughs> I know, I forgot already. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <sighs> You can visit our website, 
the cosmic surveillance. <laughs> We're all over the place. <laughs> I mean, we can't even get through the credits. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> I don't think I was recording. You're joking. You are joking. <laughs> I am joking. <laughs> oh, damn! <laughs> Don't do that to me. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs>